a lot of times we we fail to make the distinction between um, what I call debating an idea versus debating an implication. You know, an idea refers to the content of what a person says. An, Im an implication refers to what we think it would mean were we to acknowledge what they said is true. So if someone says something like, you know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a black person. I, I believe in racism. You know, uh, someone might say, oh, you're, you're just blaming white people for all your problems. So so that's a, that's an example of debating the implication rather than the idea. Here's a person who said, you know, I believe that racism is a problem. And the perceived implication of that is, and you are also a socialist who believes that all white people owe you an apology or something like that. Well, we don't know if that's true. Those two things can be separated. You can believe that racism exists and be a capitalist, or you can be a socialist. We, we, don't, we don't know what the political economic philosophy is. And, and what happens is a lot of people are so afraid of what they think it would mean if they were to acknowledge your point is true, that they never give themselves the permission to make common sense observations about life. People don't respond to what you actually say. They respond to the political party they think you're representing when you say it. And so instead of asking, is that true? Or is that false? Is that useful? Is that useless? They ask, is that the liberal position or the conservative position? Is that guy on our side or is he on somebody else's side? And people don't know if they can acknowledge what you say is true until they figure out how they think you're trying to use that truth for the sake of a political agenda. And something that could improve conversation so much is to just separate those things. Let me hear you talk about your, your belief. Let me hear you talk about your experience. And, and then I can ask you questions about what the implication of that seems to be. You know, I, I, I actually had someone ask me one time, uh, this was a white friend who asked me if I thought that some problems in the black community today are the result of, you know, things that happened during the times of slavery, right? And without knowing that this person would make so many arrogant assumptions about other parts of my worldview based on that answer alone, I said, yeah, I think so, you know, I think so. And they immediately got defensive and said, well, I, 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 I think you're making other people responsible, you know, for your life just because you're not getting, you know, the results that you want and I'm not responsible for your problems. And I said, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up. Because I know you complain to me when you have problems, but have I ever complained to you? Have I ever come to you talking about how unhappy I am? Have I ever even slightly indicated to you that I'm not in the middle always in the middle of creating the results I want out of life. So don't bring that victim stuff to me. Don't do that to me. You asked me a yes or no question. And I said, yes, if you want to know my philosophical arguments for it, I'm happy to give it to you. But why assume that I'm some angry person who's trying to find an excuse for why I'm so unhappy? Or why assume that I think you need to give me five dollars? Why assume <laughs> I think you need to bow down and apologize to me? I don't have any of that baggage going on. I just thought there was a cause and effect relationship between two things. Would you like to know my actual philosophy about what the best way to respond to it is? Because you might actually like it, especially if you call yourself a capitalist, right? But but we don't get to have those kinds of conversations because we're so busy responding to the perceived implication. And, and I think conversations can go much further if we can make that distinction. The thing about race. It's interesting that you talked about um, most people, you know, most people have good intentions. I think one of the greatest disservices to the conversation on race in America is that we have made it all about consciously held intentions rather than outcomes. And, um, and all that is valuable in the discussion has been lost at, at, at the level of that mistake. You know, Thomas Sowell says that you, you must judge a policy not by the intentions, but by, but by the outcomes. And so, you know, if your intentions are benevolent and you claim to love black people, that doesn't matter to me one bit. What, what, what's the outcome of what you're actually doing? And if your intentions are nefarious and you hate black people, I don't care about that either because the mere hatred of me doesn't mean you have any power to oppress me, to violate my individual rights. I wanna know about the outcome, right? And I, I think what has happened is we, we have subscribed to this cartoonish concept of racism. And what's interesting is when you look at racism throughout history, I, I actually don't know if I can find a single example 
of a racist that thought of themselves as being racist. <laughs> now, now, hang with me here. Yeah, now, what, no, you I agree. See, what you will see is you will see some people who are so like sick and tired of being called racist and they're tired of defending themselves. They, they, they will defensively kind of like give in out of frustration and be like, yeah, okay, fine. I'm racist. Fine. You'll see that. But I've never seen a person in history that was actually racist who thought of themselves as racist. So find for me your example of a racist person, whether it's KKK or white nationalist, whatever, and actually go listen to that person and what they say. I'm not saying, I'm not denying existence of racism, so, so hang with me. But I'm saying, if you look at what a racist does and says from the vantage point of their own internal logic, it often sounds like this. Man, I'm just looking out for my family. I'm just looking out for my family. I'm just trying to make sure that our rights are protected. I'm just trying to make sure my daughter's okay, that my son is okay. I'm just trying to make sure my wife is okay. I'm just trying to, you know, they, they, you know, I'm just trying to make sure we good. You know, e even in times of slavery where we have this romanticized, completely erroneous view of American history, that there was a point in the past where America agreed on like the quality of life for black folks. And that everybody agreed during that time that racism was this big problem and that black people had this low quality of life. The main arguments for keeping black folks as slaves made by the whites at that time were arguments that were couched in the rhetoric of compassion. The, 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 the main arguments were not, these black folks are, are beasts and they're evil and they don't deserve freedom. No, the main arguments were compassionate arguments, like but they can't read, like, like life is better for them on the, on the plantation. You know, e even many of the slave masters thought of themselves as being loving and nice in the same way that a human thinks of themselves towards their dog, right? Like, you know, if you own a dog, you don't see that dog as your equal, but you love that dog more than your neighbor, right? That's how these slave masters saw black folks. They didn't see themselves as being racist. And so if you want to fight racism, you are never going to succeed at the level of trying to convince people that are racist that they need to see how they are being racist in the same way that, for instance, if you want to stop someone from manipulating you, you're not going to get there by trying to convince the manipulator that they're being a manipulator because people who are manipulative don't see themselves as being manipulative. They just see themselves as doing what they got to do to survive. And it works for them, right? The way that you stop it is you take responsibility for creating boundaries that make it impossible for them to violate your individual rights. Same thing with racism. It's I don't care how you feel deep inside your soul. I care about what you actually do. And if what you're actually doing is a violation of my individual rights, let's talk about that. And I'm not going to give you an excuse to wiggle out of the conversation by reminding me that you have an American Express black car and a black dog, and therefore you can't be racist. I don't care. I don't, I don't even care about that. I don't care if there's some gooey substance inside your soul called being a racist. I don't care about your ontological state. I care about the actual behavior. If it's a violation of my individual rights, let's put a stop to it. If it's not, then you're just a powerless hater who's irrelevant to, any, to me anyway. Go ahead and keep thinking evil thoughts inside the safety of your own head. You're powerless.